Hello, and welcome uh, back to the course. So we're still talking about harmonic functions, and we're going to look at Harnack's inequality and Harnack's principle uh, today. And uh, this is uh, 7.2.3 or 7.2.4 in the book. And you can get the book in the link in the description um, as a PDF, or you can buy a paperback if you want. All right, so what are we looking at? We're looking at Harnack's inequality, and we're going to look at two versions of it. One. Um, it's going to have very specific, uh, um, very specific constants um, in the disk because the disk is nice, and then we're going to use that to prove a more general one, one for basically any domain. So, but for the disk, we get sort of nicer one, and, and these constants out here are optimal, right? So, what does it say? It says that if we have a harmonic function that's non-negative, and remember. Non-negative harmonic functions are the analog, basically what, what bounded was for holomorphic functions. For harmonic functions, if you remember from uh, when we introduced harmonic functions, for harmonic functions, non-negative is, is basically the analog of that, analog of what bounded was for holomorphic functions. So suppose that we have such a function. Um, harmonic, non-negative function uh, that's defined in some capital R disk. And let's take little r, uh, a smaller radius uh, that's um, so basically a, a, you know we're, we're looking at a smaller disk uh, that's completely inside this guy then what we have is uh, is this inequality if we look at the value of the function at the center point uh, um, you know so f of p right and we scale it either we make it slightly smaller or we make it slightly bigger right by by these two particular constants, uh, then we get that the value of the function on the entire smaller disk is bracketed between those two. So basically, what does it say? It says that if, you know, uh, if the function is harmonic far enough out, and I'm only looking at, uh, at a smaller, uh, smaller disk, basically, uh, it can just sort of willy-nilly do what it wants. Uh, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's bounded in a way, right? Uh, so it gives me control of um, how how badly this, uh, you, know, uh, you know, what this can do. And uh, sort of the, the, the larger the capital R is compared to the little r, the more control I have, right? So the further out it is uh, harmonic, the more control I have. It's basically what it, what it says, right? All right. So, um, so first in the proof is uh, well, let's look at these guys and these constants, and they're um, and as a function of little r. So the upper one is increasing um, in r, and the lower one is decreasing in r. So uh, what that means is that uh, uh, we only need to prove this for uh, for z in the boundary. Of this of this disk, uh, because really, if, if you proved it for, uh, uh, you, you know, if you want to prove it for some point inside, then you could have just proved it for a smaller disk where that point is now on the boundary of that smaller disk, and then just sort of extrapolate. So you're going to actually prove um, a, a strong inequality. Uh, so, so we really just just need to worry about z on this this little circle on this little r circle. All right, so let S be a radius that's, uh, so capital S, it's, so we're really going to be taking a limit as these S's go to R. So, so think of it as just something slightly less than R. Uh, and it's really because the function is not defined up to R. Uh, so we're going to want to take a limit, right? So, so we want, want the function to be actually be nice on the S circle. Okay, <clears throat> now let's write uh, uh, F at these z's, so z's in this on this circle, that's what this, uh, these guys are, using the Poisson kernel, right? So, so we're integrating over this s disk, this capital s disk, using uh, the Poisson kernel. That gives us a representation of f because it's harmonic, um, and let's rewrite. So this is the this is the Poisson uh, uh, kernel on a uh, on an arbitrary disk, not the unit disk, right? Which is basically just it's rescaled in this nice way uh and if you if you do a little bit of algebra uh that's what it is right 
So, so we look at this expression, right? And uh, um, we notice that if we start with S minus R, capital S plus R, basically this thing just with, with S's instead of R's, uh, well, we can rewrite it again, just, just by algebra. Basically, we're multiplying by uh, I guess S plus R uh, on top and bottom, right? Uh, and so we just write it in a um, in a stupid way like this. But now that looks a lot like this, except this term, right? But it has a cosine term, and that cosine goes between negative one and one. And we can uh, uh, so <laughs> we can uh, we can put that in, um, and we'll get uh, we'll get this inequality. So now we have this uh, the the Poisson kernel, right? And we have a, a lower bound for it. And in the same way, we just now replace again, which you know, it's it's uh, the cosine is between minus one and one, so we can do the the, the other inequality, and we get to notice that there's a plus sign, minus sign, right? So we went from, uh, 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 I guess when the cosine was uh, minus one to plus one, right? So so that gives us these two um, these two inequalities, and if you simplify this, um, it's it's this it's basically this this upper uh, upper constant over here. All right. So now, uh, so let's let's look back at this thing, right? So that's that's basically what this is, right? And notice that f is non-negative, and the Poisson kernel is non-negative, and you know these these guys are not like everything's non-negative. Everything's everything's wonderful. Uh, so that means that if I'm if I have a product of two non-negative functions, uh, I want to bound the integral. I can just bound one of them. Right, so uh, so let's bound uh, let's bound the the Poisson kernel from above by this guy, right? Uh, and now notice I've already pulled it out. Notice that this upper bound is uh, it doesn't depend on t, right? That's the point, really. Um, I have uh, I have uh, you know I'm relating the Poisson kernel. I have lower bound and upper bound that does not depend on t, right? And so I can I can now pull it out and uh, notice that what's left is just the 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 uh, average value of f on the s circle, but mean value property says that that's actually just f of p, right? Actually, that should be that should be equal to. <laughs> um, all right. So, but less than equal to works just uh, just the same. Okay. So. Uh, so we've proved uh, this guy well for s instead of r, but we're just going to take a limit, and the the, the other direction falls exactly in the same way. You're just going to use uh, this inequality, right? Uh, and then you take a limit as s goes to r, and you get um, uh, you get the term, right? All right. So that was rather rather simple. Uh, that's basically just looking at uh, it, it really follows from the Poisson formula, right? Poisson formula and bounding the, the, the Poisson kernel. All right, and the inequalities are actually optimal. Uh, you, you, uh, the, the, the constants that we're getting are optimal. Uh, so let's look at the, in, the, in the disk. Well, let's, let's make capital R be 1 and, and B be 0, right? Uh, then the term says this, right? And, uh, you know, here's a... Uh, Here's the function that will that will achieve equalities um, at different points. So, so take the real part of one plus z one minus z, right? This is actually the Poisson kernel, uh, except the the one over two pi, but it's essentially the Poisson kernel. Um, so it's it's real part of a holomorphic thing. So yeah, this this is harmonic. Uh, it's positive on the disk. It's Poisson kernel. Uh, so you've proved that at zero, it's one. So that's going to make these things easier, right? And now, if I plug in r, little r for z, uh, then well, I get I get precisely you know this guy, right? Because f of zero is one, so that that's that's not there. Uh, and uh, if I plug in, uh, sorry, uh, I plug in uh, r here, well, I get precisely one plus r, one minus r. So I get an equality here, right? And similarly, if I plug in minus r, I get, well, <laughs> I'm going to get precisely this thing, 
uh, you know, over here. So I'm going to get an inequality here. So that means that I cannot choose better constants uh, than than these guys, right? So it it really is. Those are the optimal constants uh, given the information that I have um, in the theorem, right? Okay. Now there is a general version of this. Um, and in the general version, we're just going to prove that there is some constant. We're not going to get the best constant. A lot of times, some constant is good enough. And uh, it's really, you know, the whole thing is really one inequality in, in a sense. Um, so, so this is really what, what we're getting in general. Uh, so suppose that we have a domain, u, and a compact uh, subset uh, of u. Right? Then there exists a constant. This constant depends on k. So for different, uh, uh, for different compact sets, we'd get different constants c. So there exists a c depending on k and u, of course, but you know, u is fixed. But for each k, you will get a different constant. And basically what you have is that if I take any non-negative harmonic function f and I look at its, its supremum, so the most it can be on k, that's actually controlled by its infimum uh, on this k, right? Um, so c could be very large. Uh, actually, what we're going to prove it's, it's going to be some some big power of three, uh, but in general, it it could be better than what we're going to prove it is. Uh, but you know, there is some c. There could be some ideal c. Uh, we're not going to try to look for it. It could it would be uh, probably very hard for for your know, random k to find the best c. Uh, okay. So, uh, so that's what uh, that's what the the general Harnack inequality is. So, you know, this this the fact that this is the domain is is important because if it's not a domain, then, yeah, you, you you can think about it. It's an exercise. <laughs> think about why this not being uh, connected and therefore like k not necessarily being connected uh, is going to be a, a problem, but. Because u is connected, we can assume that k is connected. I mean, we can always increase k, make k slightly bigger. If we prove a constant for a slightly bigger k, we get uh, uh, we get a constant for a smaller k. So assume that uh, k is connected. Uh, so uh, how do we do that? Well, by making k bigger, you can always uh, cover by finitely many closed disks. Uh, and so uh, if you cover it by finitely many closed disks, uh, it's going to have, at worst, finitely many components, topological components, right? Uh, so it doesn't have to be disks, but, you know, whatever. You can, you can basically uh, first ensure that it's finitely many components. Because once you have finitely many components, U is pass connected. You could, you could connect these finitely many uh, components by pass. So you could, you know, there's going to be a K that's, 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 um, that contains your smaller K that actually uh, uh, that is actually connected because u is connected, right? So let's just assume that k is connected. Now let r be less than half the distance from k to the boundary. k is compact, so it's some positive distance to the boundary. So let r be less than half of that. So basically, if if I look at uh, at a uh, you know at a disk of radius two r, it's still in u. Right, that's that's going to be the the point. And so now, cover k, k is compact, so it's you know you can cover it by finitely many disks of radius r. R could be very small, but you know you only need finitely many disks. Let's say I need capital N disks of radius r, and the disks of radius two r are still in U, right? So now fix uh, uh, fix two points on k. Zeta and Xi. Um, and we're going to try to uh, basically uh, get some sort of, you know, uh, control the value of one in terms of the value of the other, right? So uh, we can reorder these disks. Uh, you know, we just relabel for the purposes of the following computation. Uh, so for any two points, we're always going to relabel. Uh, because these things, uh, th these disks cover K, uh, zeta is in one disk, so let's call it uh, the, the the first disk. Let's uh, you know let's uh, z1 the, the the first center uh, point. Let it be the one that that contains zeta, and uh, uh, 
then uh, we can also have uh, you know the, the we're going up to uh, uh, n disks, and the, the C is going to be in the nth one. And we also want to assume that uh, the uh, if we're going from zj to zj plus one from one uh, one disk to the next, uh, so we're going from the first disk to the to the um, to the uh, to the to the nth disk, uh, that these disks always overlap, right? So we're basically taking you know we're kind of moving along the disk and we're taking this the shortest possible path that we could uh, take in terms of these disks, right? Uh, so so that's uh, 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 that's what this means, right? So we're, we've relabeled our disks so that in the first little n disks we get from from zeta to c, uh, and uh, you know these disks always overlap if, if we take two uh, uh, you know consecutive ones. All right, and we can do that because it's k is connected. The picture is the following, right? So I have uh, zeta over here, so. Zeta is in the Z1 disk, and then we find some Z2 disk, some Z3 disk, some Z4 disk, and uh, C is in the Z4 disk. And there could be other disks around as well. We don't have to use all the disks. Um, you know, if 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 uh, C was somewhere closer, we'd probably use fewer disks. Like if C was over here somewhere, uh, then we will only use two disks, let's say, right? Okay, but we can always get there infinitely many disks, uh, and there are at most capital N disks, so at most capital N disks. All right, so <clears throat> suppose that, that F is just uh, some um, harmonic non-negative uh, function on U. We have that all of the, the, the two R disks uh, for all the ZJ are in U. Uh, so therefore, if we have uh, any, any point in the R disk, in the smaller disk, right, uh, we we can apply we can apply the uh, the uh, Harnack for disks uh, to, to this guy right so two R would be the capital R little R would be the little R right so we get so this is just the uh, the Harnack's inequality for disks uh, applied in this setting for this uh, for this W and uh, what we get is uh, well if if we look at the this this constant out here r just cancels and i get one third and over here i get three right so i have one third times f of z j is less than or equal to f of w is less than or equal to three f of z j right for any w in this disk right actually in the closed disk too but that's you know, we we're only going to need it in the disk all right so what what did we get well we get these two uh, two inequalities. F of W is less than or equal to 3 times ZJ, and F of ZJ is less than or equal to 3 times F of W. Right? So we can relate from above or below uh, you know, any point in this disk to, uh, uh, to, to ZJ, right? uh, the, the values of F at those two points. And they at most uh, change by a factor of 3. All right, so now we're going to follow the disk. So we're going to go from zeta to c. Uh, we're going to basically, you know, follow this these n disks, right? So first, zeta is in the r disk around z1. So therefore, f of zeta is less than or equal to three times f of z1, right? Now, suppose that q is a midpoint between uh, uh, zj and zj plus one. So then uh, Q is actually in the intersection of the two disks. Um, I drew them in the in this in this picture over here. Uh, they're not labeled, but they're drawn in here, right? The, in these intersections, those are the Qs. Those are the points that are in the middle uh, between these two uh, between each two successive points, right? And that's why we're using the fact that uh, uh, the, the the intersection of the two consecutive disks are uh, is not empty. That is. This Q is there, right? All right. So, so now, if I start at f of z j, I want to end up at f of z j plus one, and I first go to Q, which is still in the R disk around z j. So I have this uh, this inequality, and now Q is also in this guy. <laughs> so I'm gonna get uh, uh, get this inequality, right? And uh, 
So now I forget about Q, and I have that f of z j. Uh, let's write this here. f of z j is less than or equal to three squared, so nine times uh, f of z j plus one. Right. So each time I go from z j to z j plus one, you know, f changes at most by a factor of nine, maybe by a lot less, but at most by a factor of nine. Okay. Now the last one it's the same thing right so if if we if we're in the last disk we now go to c right and you know now again it changes by a factor of at most 3 so all in all what happens is that i start at zeta right then i then i go to z1 then i go and i take n minus 1 steps each time uh you know i uh, I go up, uh, you know, uh, I multiply by at most uh, z squared, right? So it's 3 times uh, 3 squared uh, to the n minus 1, right? And then uh, then another 3, right? So so what I get is, is this inequality from zeta to xi, right? Now n, well, n depended on zeta and xi, little n, right? But it's always less than to capital N. So I could really just write down that f of zeta is less than equal to 3 to the 2 capital N uh, f of zeta, right? So that's just this constant, right? Now, the point is, is this capital N depends on k. I mean, it depended on how many disks we needed, right? And that really depended on the distance to the boundary. But that's it. Once you knew the distance of k, once k was connected, and you knew the distance of k to the boundary, uh, you could figure out, you, you would take r to be half of that, and then you'd cover uh, k by those disks. And uh, uh, so this capital N depended on that. So once you knew the distance to the boundary and k was connected, uh, you could... Uh, 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 you knew capital N, right? So it only depended on K. It didn't depend on F. And it didn't depend on which points on K I'm taking, right? So um, so uh, now I can take supremum and femum, right? Of, uh, you know, over all zeta and C, and I get the right result. So this is the, you know, then this would be the C. This would be the, the, the constant in the, uh, in, in the theorem, right? Now, this is this is nowhere near the optimal one, probably, but it's explicit, right? I mean, I can I can figure it out. Uh, you know, um, I can figure out some C. Maybe a much better C would work, but but this one works. Uh, by the way, note that you know I could have uh, a fairly small C, but if it's if it's maybe like two components and I needed to connect them and they had to pass through some sort of, uh, you know, like maybe maybe you got very narrow at a point and you needed to, you need to basically follow a path from one, one component of K to the other one, that little R might, might be a lot smaller than what you'd expect, right? So be careful about that. But anyway, so we have an explicit, you know, so you first have to connect K, then you can figure out uh, an R and uh, uh, from that you can figure out the capital N and from that you can figure out a C. It's probably not optimal, probably not the best one, but uh, it's explicit. I can I can figure out a, a explicit C if I want it. If I if I'd be, you know, if someone gave me a K, I could give you a, I could give you a C, right? All right. <clears throat> so let's uh, talk about a couple of you know a few exercises uh, on on this. So so first. Uh, so it's a fairly simple exercise. What an example where Harnack's general inequality does not hold if U is not connected. And it's not that, you know, it's, 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 it's not a hard one uh, to, uh, to, to do, right? So, so basically, don't assume any connectedness of, of U or K, right? Um, so uh, second, uh, so find a counterexample for Harnack's and this is just you know just for the just for the basic Harnack's inequality. Uh, if f is not assumed to be non-negative, so if you don't assume non-negative, then you don't get uh, these inequalities. So so uh, so do the following. So find a harmonic function not necessarily non-negative, uh, such that for every um, every m, uh, so f for every m you find a harmonic function. Sorry, uh, such that uh, uh, f is one at zero. 
but uh, it's bigger than M at uh, one half, right? So basically saying, I, I don't have any, it's, it's going to be harmonic in the same disk, but at uh, one little R would be half. I have absolutely no control of uh, F at one half in terms of the value at zero, which is going to be one, right? And again, this is not a hard one to, uh, to figure out. Now, the next thing, uh, maybe somewhat more interesting of an exercise, so use Harnax inequality to prove uh, Loewell's theorem for harmonic functions. So again, uh, remember that the analog of bounded uh, is non-negative, right? So, so what it says is that if it's if we have a harmonic function defining the entire complex plane and it's non-negative, then it's constant, right? That's Loewell's theorem. All right, and you can use Harnack's inequality to uh, to prove it. All right. So, <clears throat> so now that we have Harnack's inequality, let's prove Harnack's principle. Uh, so suppose that we have a monotone sequence of harmonic functions on some domain U, right? So it's monotone. That's all we know about it. They're harmonic functions, and uh, the next one is always bigger than or equal to the previous one. Then there's two possibilities. Either they go to plus infinity uniformly on all compact subsets, right? So, so on every compact subset, it's uniformly going to plus infinity, right? I mean, essentially, if, 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 we'd, if we'd allow plus infinity, uh, you know, it's, it's, you're always going to get a, a, a nice limit. Or, so if either they go to uh, infinity or they go to a harmonic function, um, again, uniformly on compact subsets. Right, so they have to converge right to a harmonic function or infinity, right? So you have to allow infinity, but if you allow infinity, they always converge, right? And they converge to a harmonic function, right? So it's a very strong statement. All that we know is that these this is a monotone sequence. All right. So first, uh, in the proof, without loss of generality, assume f is non-negative. Why? Well, you could always just subtract F1, right? You could subtract the first one from all of them. And because by monotonicity, you get uh, that they're all non-negative, right? Uh, so, so we can assume that they're all non-negative. Now, by monotonicity, we can also assume that they this converges pointwise, right? I mean, if we allow plus infinity. Right? So it can converge to something finite or converge to plus infinity because at each point we're just getting a monotone sequence of uh, real numbers, right? So suppose that for some p uh, we get a limit of infinity, right? So start with any compact set and add p to it, right? That's still going to be a compact set. So now use Harnack's inequality, uh, fn at p. Well, that's less than or equal to because p is in k prime, right? Uh, that's less than or equal to the supremum, right? We're just taking supremum over a bigger set of of f n, right? So that's that's definitely in uh, 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 that's definitely a, uh, an inequality, right? And now we apply Harnack, right? Uh, we're applying it to k prime, so we get some c, right? That depends on k prime, such that the supremum of uh, of fn is bounded by the infimum of uh, of fn over this k prime. And now uh, for k, well, k is just a smaller set possibly. Uh, so uh, you know, so if we replace that in infimum by infimum over k, uh, we get an inequality here. So uh, we get that fn uh, at p is less than or equal to C, which is um, this constant only depends on K, uh, times the infimum of Fn over uh, over this K, right? What does that mean? That means that on K, we, get, we have, uh, uh, this function goes uniformly to plus infinity, right? Uh, because <laughs> this, this number will go uh, to plus infinity uh, 
you know, basically because of this, <laughs> right? So we just need one point. We figure out how fast that is going to infinity, and that's how fast this is going to infinity, right? Well, you know, well, given a C, right? So we get the, this uniform convergence uh, uh, to infinity over uh, z and k, right? All right. So that was if uh, if the if the limit was infinite for some point. So what's left was well, suppose that the limit is finite for uh, f uh, f this should say z. Sorry. Uh, so let's just suppose it's uh, finite for all points. Uh, in you. So, so we have, uh, in, in particular, we have pointwise limit to some function f, right? Uh, so, uh, so that's what I'm calling f of z, right? So it's, there's, we already have a function f defined on u, right? We just need to uh, show that we're converging uh, uniformly on compact subsets and therefore to a harmonic function. So. Let's take a compact set, uh, subset of U and take this C from Harnax, uh, uh, that's that's uh, 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 for this K, and let's take any point in K. And given epsilon, uh, take M and N uh, such that we have uh, this, right? And I don't need the absolute values because M is bigger than N and uh, this is a monotone sequence, so this is, this is always positive. And let's just make it uh, so that um, it's uh, uh, less than epsilon over c, right? And we're basically using, uh, you know, <laughs> using the fact that this, these are Cauchy sequences, right? It's we have conversions, all right? And we're looking, we're looking at p, so we're looking at the, you know, Cauchy at p, right? That's giving us our uh, our constants. All right. So now let's apply Harnack's. So the supremum of uh, of this difference of fm minus fn over k, well, it's bounded by the infimum, right? Uh, which is bounded by, well, the infimum is bo bounded by, you know, the function at any particular point, p, right? Which we're multi by multiplying by c, so therefore we get less than epsilon. So therefore we get that this thing, is less than epsilon. The supremum of fm minus fn over k. So we're starting with one point, and now we're getting uh, the, the supremum over all of k, right? So we can choose this mn, uh, basically how we're choosing them at a particular point, meaning this is uniformly Cauchy on k. Uh, therefore, well, I mean, I mean, we already know that it converges, <laughs> right? So. Uh, it, it's it's it converges uniformly on K, right? Well, that means that F is harmonic, right? By um, uh, by Harnack's first theorem, right? Uh, that uh, we had a uniform limit of uh, harmonic functions was uh, harmonic. All right, so so that's Harnack's uh, principle, right? So you need very little to get. Uh, Conversions of uh, harmonic functions. Well, in in this case, we we have uh, uh, we have uh, 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 we have monotone, but we can we can uh, just do it uh, um, if 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 we approach from below. Uh, we don't have to have a monotone sequence. So, so this is the other version. Um, so if I have a domain and a sequence of non-negative harmonic functions uh, that uh, uh, and and we have uh, that uh, p is fixed, right? So so first, uh, if uh, uh, if these guys go to infinity at that one point, then they converge to infinity on compact subsets, and that falls by the same proof as we just did, really. B. So if uh, if you have if it's bounded by if, if they're all bounded by uh, by a harmonic function f, uh, and you go to the harmonic function at one point, right? So f n goes to your your upper bound at one point, then this the sequence actually converges to f uh, uh, uniformly on compact subsets. 
All right. <clears throat> you can also prove a Montel-like uh, theorem for harmonic functions. Uh, so suppose that we have uh, an open set and, and a sequence of uh, non-negative uh, harmonic functions. So there's uh, at least one or both of these are, are true. There is a subsequence converging to, um, to infinity uniformly uh, on uh, uh, compact subsets. Or, or both, uh, there is a subsequence convergence to a harmonic function uniformly on compact subsets. So, so basically, we get Montel, right? Or the the right version of Montel uh, for harmonic functions, right? And okay, so the the one difference is, of course, that we're talking about non-negative uh, harmonic functions, and we're we have to uh, allow going to uh, infinity. All right, so we'll. Uh, uh, so next time, what we're going to uh, talk about is uh, extending harmonic functions. So either um, isolated singularities or uh, the Schwartz reflection principle. So extending uh, along a, uh, along a boundary. So uh, you know defining harmonic functions on a larger domain, basically. So that's that's what we're going to look at uh, next time. All right. So see you then.